Hi, this is uh, Vaughan Smith in Nova Scotia. Um, it's a beautiful day today. We had a big nor'easter yesterday and it ended up pouring with rain for like almost 24 hours and it washed away all the snow. So it's actually pretty out there. I don't know if you can see or not. Let's give you a quick look. My windows are filthy, of course. There you go. I guess the birds are all out there too. All right. <laughs> Just so I'll have this setting up for a little bit. I've done chip and dips before in another video, um, but I think I incorporated it with some other things. Or maybe I never posted it, I don't know. But, um, so this is B-Mix 5, and I fired that up to cone 8 recently and it was fine, so uh, no bloating or anything. That was a surprise. So if it's a ball that's gonna have chips put in, I always like the, the edge of it to curve over a little bit towards the center of the ball so that it doesn't actually um, pour the salsa out over onto the table or onto the chips, basically. So this is my normal ball. I just posted a video on Balls. Well, yeah, it should have a fairly narrow base, I think. There we go. And it should be a little wider than that. I do that with my little metal rib. Let's see at the bottom of it. Yeah, I can probably push that in a little bit further. So I try to push underneath so the wire will go underneath and then put a little groove in just above the foot area. So when I place this on the chip plate, uh, I'll not be able to squish that little lump of clay down onto the plate. So it's got like a little easier area to use a modeling tool on and now this is the shape that I was talking about this is quite a big ball this is for the party we're all gonna have when we can have lots of friends over sometime by the end of this year is I hope So, so the scooping, and it falls into the, the, the basically into the actual uh, chip when you're dipping, and it, it kind of curves in again. And now you can do it any way you want, because I like balls that have flanges that go out as well. One I took out of the kiln this morning. There you go. So a chip plate, chip and dip. So let's lift this one off. I've got two balls of clay that I'm gonna bang together. This is three pounds of clay. So, like I've shown you before, I have my little wall here that I can stick my elbow in. So when I'm centering a slightly bigger piece of clay, I don't have to struggle because my elbow is locked into that wall. And because I just put two balls of clay together, I'm going to do a quick coning to actually... Um, Make sure those two balls of clay are mixed nicely. And then, because it 
centered as I push down. I keep going until it feels a bit tacky. Then lift your hand off slowly. Go back on with some water underneath. When it feels tacky, you just let go slowly. Same again. Push down until it feels a bit tacky. And keep doing that because that's how you don't want to go too thin, but how to make a plate, which I've done in videos before as well. I've got the window open, and this is February 3rd in Nova Scotia, because it's nice out. That uh, nor'easter brought some humid, warm air up. Some places have got 10, 11 degrees today. Okay, now use your rubber rib push down onto this. You don't want to make it too thin even if it's a chip and dip either. I love elegant light things that you pick something up and they don't weigh anything. It's just beautiful but they don't last very long because they'll break. They become china cabinet pieces and it's nice to use really nicely made handmade pottery. Okay, now that's the basic plate. You could leave it like that, that's the plate. But if you can just lift that edge, you can make a little rim. This bat has a slight, it's a ply, not plywood, a part, particle board, fiber board I think they call them, but varnished but I think it got in, left in the water because there's a little bump in the plate, in the bat. There you go, so I've lifted up about a two and a half inch wall, and she's gonna get stretched out, but not all the way yet. Now this is the way I make my chip and dips. I'm going to show you another way, but I don't get any failure rates doing it this way. And when I made them originally, I was, you know, I'm good, so I could just throw the bowl attached to the plate straight away. But I actually did start losing some through cracking, so I think it was something about the stress, maybe. Um, so I changed the way I did it by doing it this way, and I haven't never really had them crack anymore. Now if I was using a stoneware with grog in it, that may not have been the case. But this B-mix clay is almost porcelain. Okay, so I'm not going to take it down completely. Let's lift that over a bit. But I want to get it out of the way. Just a little bit. This is the original bowl, I just threw it. I'm gonna wipe off the bottom, just make sure there's no water there. Place it in the center. And now we have to make sure it's centered. And this is so soft and it's, you know, thrown, what, five minutes ago. Perfect, straight away. Well, at least I don't have to play around because that would dent the rim of the ball if I started moving it backwards and forwards. So now I'm just using my finger to push in the very center, not the, you know, right in the center. If I tried doing it about an inch away from the center, it might spin the ball a little bit because it's not really stuck to the plate yet. But I'm just working backwards and forwards from the outer edge to the center, from the center to the outer edge now that I think it's stuck. But my initial pressure was right in the center and of course I didn't throw the bowl with a really thick inside because I've already got the plate for that thickness <clears throat> all right so using the rib this is why I lowered it so I can get my hand in there now I'm just going to press down as it's spinning to join that outer flap that I had sticking out 
and then once it's stuck, I can basically use my rib to press that flat down a little firmer. I hope you can see this properly. I'm just using the rib and my finger on the inside to have a little bit of pressure backwards and forwards to really seal that down. And that's it. That's the way I make my chipper dips. Okay. So it may be even five. I think it's four and a half, or it could be five pounds of clay. So it'll make a pretty big chip and dip. Okay, and I'll bang it around a lot, so I'm gonna cone it out as well. There you go. Yeah, I love having a mild winter like this, but boy, oh boy, is that worrying with global warming. Because I'm right on the water, I was watching, I actually filmed some of the storm yesterday. Maybe I'll put a little bit of that in one of the videos. There's a bakery with a dock right next to me, and their dock was completely submerged underwater. So watch what I'm going to do here because there's a slight difference. Now, not, that's still about an inch and a bit thick. So now I'm going to move my hand over. And press down to leave a lump in the center. see and guess what I'm going to do anyway now. Let's see if I can get my rib in there. Sometimes you can just still compress with the rib. And stop it. I want to take a look at this before it stops. Yeah, it's still in a good thickness there. Right, so now we've got a ball of clay in the center. Let's see if we can center this just in case it's not centered. I've got another way to show you how to do this in a second, but I don't think there's any advantage other than the fact that I had some pieces crack. Speed wise, I think you can make these both about the same amount of time. So the economy of it is good either way. Now I don't know if it's the stress built up in the clay when you do something like this or what, or if you could do a, a, a sort of stoneware grog clay that wouldn't crack. All right, so there we go. We've got my little ball. So then I just have to lift up the wall. Now I'm going to get my rib under there again and compress that area. There we go. If you're going to make them this way, I just feel like you've got to make sure that bottom flat area of the plate is nice and compressed. Now it's a nice shaped ball just there. I mean, you could leave it the way it is. But if you just round off the inside like that 
it'll hold more dip. Let's get my metal rib. It's nice to compress as you're pushing out with the metal rib, compressing the clay back a little bit. And that's about four and a half inches across, I would say, as a ball. So you can easily get a chip into there, even though with the shrinkage rate, of course. And there's a curve going in there. Now, if I wanted to, you could actually just, this that's, it needs to be a little wetter than that. For elegance sake, it's still dry. You could just leave the curve in a bit lower down and just give yourself that little flange that makes it look a little nicer. And yet I still have on the inside the little ball area where the, the, the liquid will fall into the chip. And then, finally, just lift up your wall. And I also, with my chip and dips, I actually hang them on the wall in my gallery, as well as putting them on plate stands and things like that. So what I do then is put picture wire around the outer edge. So there's my groove underneath. Take the other end of the rib and just compress slightly above that. So I actually created a channel that a piece of picture wire can go underneath. And then you don't see how it's hanging, it's just floating on the wall. And I kind of like things to look, I wouldn't say precarious, but when somebody sees it just floating on the wall, it makes you think, how is it doing that? Oh, I'm throwing on a Brent CXC wheel, by the way, if you needed to know. Highly recommended wheel. Now, this one's about 35 years old, I think. 90, late 80s I bought this. And there's the rim. And this is five, six pounds of clay. I'm not going down too low yet because <coughs> it actually uh, would collapse since the clay is very soft. Oh, and if you wanted to, just decoratively speaking, you can put a little fake spiral throwing wings type thing in there. There we go. So take that off. I've actually poked through the rims occasionally if these are hard to get off. So be careful. There's the profile of it. You can maybe see the groove on the bottom. Wedge your elbow into something. If you have a big piece of clay like this, I'm not even trying to put a lot of pressure on. I'm just pushing my hand in, wedge between the wall and the wheel. Wall and the piece of clay, I should say. All right. Cone it, just because I know I had an irregular piece of clay there when I put it down. Oh, actually, let's do one more bit, a bit taller right off the top of the picture. So I'm just making a plate. Make sure we don't get 
too close through. My heel on my hand on my right arm is just pushing out and I'm pushing back with my little fingers on my left hand so I can keep that clay under compression as I stretch it. And then going backwards and forwards kind of breaks up that stress that you're building up in the clay. All right. Now, let's get the clay off my hand. I feel like this takes a little longer to do it this way, but you might like it better. Square, so I'm gonna bang it into a round. Yeah, because of the storm yesterday, I've seen tree limbs and dock pieces of wood from somebody's dock floating around today, so there was damage. Okay, so you have a nice round ball of clay in the center. And now you know exactly what I'm gonna do. Don't know which way is best for you with doing it like this, but. It's all a matter of preference, I guess. You can try what you feel. Centering a big piece of clay may be um, just a bit too hard. So you could actually throw the ball separately. That reduces the size of the original piece of clay for the plate. That's pretty much it. I've got to lower the rim just like I did on the other piece. Grab the water off. I just opened the windows because it's so mild and I already have a fly just flying around my head. February 3rd, wow. It must have come from Florida. Blown up by the storm. I think they, they can hatch really fast. Okay, so now your little wall on the outside edge again. it with a sponge instead of dribbling water over it because I'll just have to take it off again I just had a wet sponge and dragged it over the area where I was going to be throwing Thanks for all the people making, posting comments and asking questions too. I don't mind answering questions. I've done this for so long. I'm actually retirement age. So uh, I'm doing it because it's fun anymore. I gave up craft fairs and I gave up selling to other galleries. I call that work. Making pottery is just being on holiday. There we go, there's the groove on the underside again. 
Okay. Then you just lower the rim again. Don't go too low. And then stop it. And that's a big one. That's about 14, 15 inches across. This is what the plate looks like the following morning. And so basically I have to lower the rim again. I keep these in a damp cupboard overnight. The rim is movable, but stiff enough so that I can actually lower it down a lot more now without it collapsing. So I place them on the wheel and using my finger, just like when I was throwing, I'll just lower them down. If you don't have a damp cover, one side of the rim could dry more than the other. And they will still raise up a little bit, even from this point. It's when they're evaporating. There you go, so that's much lower down. And it's gonna lift up a bit more um, as it dries. And this is the one I did with the bowl attached when we were throwing. So the same again, but well, that one's not quite centered on there. So basically just lowering the rim enough so that as it lifts up, as it dries, it doesn't look like a ball. You can see what I'm doing. I've got to put handles on them now. So I roll the coil. So I cut out, take off the end that's a bit irregular, and then I basically take off equal lengths times two, depending on how many platters I've got. And then, there's two ways of doing this. I've got a little paint strip, kind of, uh, if you don't have what I, the other thing I have. But basically, you roll like that at an angle slightly. And then if you want, you can go in the other direction. Not too deep. And you end up with a little rope handle. That's two of them, making sure they're the same size. And then the other way of doing this, you can buy these from your clay supplying shop. They're paddles, but if you just roll across it like that, it only gives you the one direction unless you turn it around the other way. But that's a different kind of, show you the difference. Two textures, different textures, different way of doing it. And then I take a board, a bigger one than the platter is. And I've got my water here and a sponge. And let's see if I can do this so you can see it. Bending up like that a bit to give your fingers a little room when you hold the loop handle. And then it's a good idea to make sure you get it in the right place for the other one. Okay, now you just kind of make sure you've got them fairly accurate. This one could go a little bit more that way. And then my handles, 
Now, because I just softened that down so much, it's pretty soft and you can adhere this rope without scoring and scratching to that area there. But what I do is I give myself a little cut and open it up a touch. so that I can fasten that right on the gap and then where I just wet it and you can actually just rub slowly without squishing too hard at first put a bit of pressure on and you can adhere it above and below And the same with this one. So I'm basically just giving a little cut. Dipping this in water, pushing it inside. And opening it up. And then placing it. making sure that it's fairly even and then just giving a little movement and pressure all right now the reason I have the board underneath is because that handle has got weight to it and it's not bad actually, this, this um, is just timed quite right. But I usually put a little board and a little piece of clay underneath the handle just to give it some support. Um, but it's actually staying up on its own, so it's not too bad this time. And when I've done these, sometimes the handle will you know, sort of slot down a little bit, move downwards. Underneath there, it's still a little kind of messy because of the way I pressed it on. So I just take my brush and it's hard to see underneath there, but you do the same underneath. And you, when you trim these later on, you can clean them up as you've got the plate upside down at that point. You've seen my pieces, I always have these little buttons on. Whenever I do joins, wherever you have a join, you can't drink that water. He has his own water bowl, but he always likes to drink my dirty clay water. All right, it, it strengthens the join areas, basically. Okay, so basically putting some pressure on the handle there gives you a little extra strength in that handle join. So that's the one of them done. Now stiffen up on the rim but they're still really soft on the underside. So just give yourself a little moisture. And it's a good idea what I was about to do then. Oop. Is give myself a couple of little circles to, to look at as I place this down. To make sure that way I don't have to test whether it's centered I know it's centered because of those circles and then I'm putting some pressure right in the center of the piece like I did when on the one I was attaching when I was throwing and I don't move out from the center until I feel like I've got a good contact there because and keep some water lubricated because the brush has enough to actually push it off center enough friction And really press down quite hard because you don't want this to come loose later on and then so you can see it I'll do it this direction I just take the metal part of the brush which I know there's a name for that And 
and then basically just clean it up a bit. And this is the other way that you can attach bowls after the fact. Alrighty. And then attaching the handles to either side is identical to the other one. And so that, in effect, is, you know, I've shown you several ways of making these. Okay. All right. So this one um, is the one I was going to do that's sort of off center a little bit. Um, so I'll take the smaller ball of this little grouping. All right. So. Timing is everything with clay, so I'm going to attach it here. So you're trying to, and the only problem doing it this way um, is that you can't trim these very easily. You have to sponge the bottom, so you need to be able to make sure your base is fairly clean. Um, you place it to the side, and because you can't spin it anymore, You basically, that's where you have to make sure the top part is sort of dry. And then you attach it just the same way. There you go. All right. Um, you actually, these you can make out of rebar and tie a guitar string across the end. But look how easy cutting through something is. All right. And it's a guitar string, so it's very thin. So it leaves almost no clay on the bat, unless the bat is warped, and then you might leave some that way. But, um, but basically, it's a very easy way to cut through things. The next stage is trimming. Okay, so trimming chip and dips. Um, this is where a whole bunch of chucks come, uh, become useful. Uh, if you see on my wall there, I've got a bunch of round things hanging on the wall. Those are chucks. Um, basically it's just a, a footless uh, disc, a ring, um, and what I do, I got a whole choice of those, but I also have, for anything that's a little big, uh, you can actually just use a canister. This one does have a base, it got sacrificed from my trimming wheel. Uh, it was kind of a nice piece with boats wax resisted on it, but still it became a trimming accessory. Um, and I got these pads on the side to soften where it t the piece touches. Um, and um, let's turn me on. Okay, so the chips, obviously, chip and dips, have a ball in the center, so you can't turn it upside down because the ball sticks up so much. So what I do is I've got these different size discs that I have to make sure the ball fits inside. And the little pieces of duct tape, the white things on the top, you have to sort of soften the touch where it touches, but also to stop it from sliding easily. And then you just center it as best you can. I usually put my finger in the center and just touch it, pull it towards me. Oh, and that's pretty good. One little wobble there, but it's just about there. And sometimes you can overdo it, but that's perfect now. So what I, how I do it is I put my finger right in the center, and you can feel the center point because your finger's not pulling around with it. So you feel for the center, touch your thumbs together, and then you just touch with your other finger, and you can kind of feel that area that's too far out. And then basically, when it's not far out, man, you can actually start trimming. All right. I put a groove underneath my foot there so that I can hang these on the wall because they're hard to store in a cupboard and I tell people when they buy them that you can use them for decorations too just in the kitchen on the side of a cupboard or you know above the cupboards if you you know but then you got to get a ladder to get them down but just on the side of a cupboard you can actually put a hook uh, and then you put picture wire around and it goes under that little halt, that uh, V groove, basically. You put picture all the way around with a loop, and then you can hang them on the wall. 
um, and nobody can even see how they're hanging on the wall. Now keep your finger in the center pushing down when you're trimming because the duct tape is good but it's not perfect. I mean, I don't think I've had one of these spin loose in years so it's not like it's really slippery. And you replace the duct tape if it starts to get too shiny. All right, so basically that's got most of it. Now here's a trick. These metal ribs, you can trim with them. You just put your finger in once again in the center to hold the thing down. And then I simply scrape it along the surface and it will pull off any high points. Now this is only when the clay is leather hard. There's a high point right there, I can feel it. Or it might be where my harp cut through and cut a little bit out in one area. Let's have a look. Well, it doesn't show, I can feel it, but you can't see anything. Um, but anyway, so, uh, and then I take a pebble, beach pebble. Uh, on the bottom of all my plates, I, I make them shiny because I don't glaze the bottom of my plates. So I just burnish the clay. You can get it really smooth. There's a bump there. It must be a piece of hard clay in the softer clay. And then right at the last, you just do that center point where your finger was, because sometimes you can raise a little bit of clay. And that makes them totally smooth. And the groove that's on the bottom, let's give you a little look. Oh, this is a good time to check your handle joints. These are good, so I don't need to. There's a little bit of dirty clay there. That'll be covered by glaze. Um, but there's no cracking or anything like that. So then I'll show you carefully. These are still bendable a little bit, but there's the groove so you can hang the picture wire around it and basically uh, solve the solution of storage for the customer. All right, the only chip and dip that I couldn't actually um, trim is the one where I put the chip bowl off to the side. Um, so, uh, yep, they're done. You just get fired now and glazed. All right, so now you know how to make chip and dips the way I do it. But there's lots of other ways of doing it. So, all right, thank you very much for joining me in sunny Nova Scotia today. There's a big snowstorm tomorrow and Tuesday. All right, talk soon. Bye. Thank you.